thrilled to have all of you uh, alumni from pre previous years. We're going to introduce you to a couple more recent alumnus, alumni. But Chad, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Chad Thomas, our, the principal at Sullivan High School, who's going to MC this event. Chad? Hi, everyone. It's so, it's so awesome to see your faces and hear the years that you're from. Um, you might want to mute your uh, mute your mics until you uh, until you're speaking. That'll help us a little bit. We have a we have a, a great program tonight. Uh, I am the proud principal of Sullivan High School for the last nine years. It's my ninth year. I started in July of 2013. You probably have heard or read some things maybe about Sullivan. It's it's uh, quite the school these days. It's hosts over 40 different languages at our school. Uh, it's about 622 students. Uh, and it's still a flourishing neighborhood high school that we're very proud of. Uh, it um, also, we have kids from all over the world. Uh, like I said, 40 different languages. We have all the, still the, all the same sports teams that you probably all remember when you were all going to high school and lots of clubs and activities. And we're producing graduates every year. We, last year, we graduated 180 seniors. Uh, this year, we're going to probably graduate about 165 seniors. Uh, and about 75% of them go to college, which is which something I'm really proud of. Uh, and the kids that don't go to college are either uh, either working or going to trade schools or into the military. So we're, we're really proud of that, that number. Uh, Sullivan has come a long way in the last nine years, and I'm proud to call it a leader. I think, I'm not sure if he's on the call yet, but we do have a couple of grads here tonight. Uh, one is a graduate from 2020. Uh, his name is Randy Young. He plays football at College of DuPage. Uh, and Randy, um, are, are you on the call? Yes, I'm here. How you there doing? he is. So Randy, <laughs> Randy's going to introduce himself briefly and just tell you a little bit about what he's doing uh, and how the Friends of Sullivan helped him out. Uh, what can I start? Sorry if you might be a little loud in the background. I'm currently at work. But um, my name is Randy. I'm a class of 2020. Uh, I graduated uh, leaving Sullivan actually um, with a different type of mindset. Um, me coming into Sullivan, I was thought I was just going to do my work and just get out and just come, you know, uh, just go to school and just call it a day. But my, actually, they really motivated me to do more in terms of just in, uh, in terms of just keep striving for different types of aspects of life in terms of uh, school challenges, football challenges, and most importantly, like life challenges. Um, Friendly Sullivan helped me out drastically, if I'm being honest. Um, without them, I wouldn't be here in the position I am right now, currently. Um, in terms of the scholarship they uh, provided for me, uh, that scholarship itself helped me drastically because uh, if that without that scholarship and I'm honest I wouldn't have a place to stay so I'm very grateful for them for even um, accepting me um, currently right now my goal is to go uh, division one football I'm currently at COD which is a JUCO in Glen Ellen Illinois um, I wouldn't I'm going to be here for another semester so I'm getting my AA in a year and a half instead of two years so I'm taking extra classes in the summer so I can uh, speed that process up I already have interest with a couple of schools, for example, U of I, um, Illinois State, Western Michigan, Toledo, and the, a lot of uh, different different divisions and different levels. Um, so that's a very good thing. So, yeah, that's all I really have to say. Is enough. Thank you, thank you, Randy. So, Randy also won. Uh, hey, Chad, Chad, can you hear me? It's Jan Chikowski. Hi, Jan. We're introducing. Hi. So, We're I, I wanted to say a few things because I I'm at another event. And I, but I, I, I wanted to just uh, thank you and, uh, and, and Michael Zink, who actually lived in my house at one point. Um, and uh, I am, uh, I, I'm so thrilled what, what you're doing and the, and the whole idea of who was Roger C. Sullivan. Um, I, I asked Michael, I, I'm not gonna be able to stay because I'm at an event for a Senate candidate and, and have to uh, introduce her. So, but I, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, every, everything you're doing at Sullivan, that my heart is at Sullivan High School, as you know, and I'm so proud of you, students, of the former students that we just uh, heard from, and, um, you know, that this, I'm sure this is going to be fabulous. Um, I saw, I met, I, I saw Michael some time ago, and he told me that, uh, maybe he'll explain it through his wife, who's a relative. Um, that he has all this information about Mr. Sullivan. And, and so um, I, I, I hope I will be able to, to see all that information, but not tonight, I'm afraid. So congrats on this event. And thank you, Michael Zink, 
um, for, uh, you know, pulling it all together and make sure that I get to see the, either the video or a uh, private presentation about the history. Okay, I, I'm going to have to run. Well, thank, thanks, Jan, for joining. Thanks for joining us, Jan. Okay, love you. Bye. Hi, Jan, love you. Um, <clears throat> before she jumped on, I just wanted to, rant, you know, Randy was a graduate of 2020, and uh, they also won the national championship in uh, 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 junior college football this year. So I wanted to just shout you out, Randy. Congratulations, and keep going for your dreams. Thanks for coming thank tonight. You. I know you got to go back to thank work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, bye-bye. Randy, good to see, see you. See you, everyone. Good to see you, too. <laughs> We have one more more recent graduate, uh, probably the most recent graduate here from the class of 2021. We met her um, last year when Chad had asked the Friends of Sullivan to host a picnic for the graduating seniors as they had a rough year last year with COVID. At this event, um, my girlfriend Cheryl Rosenberg and I met this young woman who's truly amazing. And she uh, proceeded to get awarded a scholarship to help her transition to her new college. Um, she's a, an immigrant from Nigeria and it's my great pleasure to not only introduce you by your first name, but I'm gonna to try to get her last name correct. Victoria Amenjamajani. How was that, Victoria? You murdered my name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is it? It's a Mandianese. All right. Uh, well, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm Victoria Mandianese. I'm original from Nigeria. I moved here two years ago, 2019. I'm sorry I'm out of breath. I just got done with track practice, and it is not it. Uh, um, I graduated last year, 2021, and so... Okay, I'm gonna go off of what um, Mike said. I met Cheryl at the uh, picnic we had at the park and she basically just asked to take my photo and I was like, mm, I don't know if that's okay. But she did take my picture and I was like, yeah, sure, would you like to model for me? At first I was like, hmm, really? Is that actually a thing? Do you really want me to model for you and stuff? And Mike called me, he talked to me, and my friends were like, you know what, I'm not going to do it because I don't know her. I'm like, well, this is my school, so, and she's, you know, part of the people that organize this program, so sure, I'm going to do it. And I told my mom, as an African lady, she's like, no, that's not possible, don't do it, it's fake, you know, and so, and then I did it, and I met this wonderful lady, Cheryl, I got to know her, she got to know me, you know. I shared some of my stories with her, you know, I, uh, she was the one person that I could like relate to, not exactly relate to, that I could actually open up to because she was, you know, ready to listen. And that was something I needed because, you know, coming from an, from an African background with like, you know, African parents that don't understand what I'm going through, like just being a teenager in high school, just, you know, starting a new life, starting a new beginning, just in a new community, you know, having you like, I don't know, like back in Nigeria, I was in a boarding school. So all I, all we do is, you know, study gossip and talk about like, it, it just the only differences we have is like ethnicity. But here in, in the U.S., we have a whole lot of different thing. It's so different, you know, and transitioning from Nigeria and coming here from a boarding school to Sullivan High School, was a drastic change to me. Like, first off, I didn't even know what racism was. <laughs> you know, that that was something, who, what, no, you know? And I moved here and people talk about this, people talk about that. I'm like, this is a lot of information. How am I gonna survive here? You know, I was just a junior. I had no, no experience, nothing. And Sullivan was there to guide me, you know, like, no one was going to tell me what to do because I'm a junior. Everybody believes, oh, she knows what she's going to do. My parents don't even understand nothing. Like, when you ask them a question, they're like, huh, what? No, 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 just okay, do it. Maria, yeah. right, right now, where are you at school right now? I'm in Cole College. And tell us about, quickly, tell us about the transition and how did Francis Sullivan help you? Okay, so, um, um, and like, um, 
Okay, so um, in high school, in uh, as a junior, I did a lot of activities and stuff, and I was just trying to, you know, pace myself just to, you know, get my uh, degree and stuff, uh, my um, diploma, and like, you know, go to go go to college. You know, my parents are like, you know, what, you might just, you know, go to community community college or something. Thing. but I really wanted to like go to an actual like four-year college there's something I really wanted to do and then just you know connecting with my professors you know having like rec uh, recommendations letters and stuff just trying to push myself you know I did a lot of activities and stuff just to push myself to you know go to an actual college and doing that I won the scholarship at Co College you know and transitioning from that coming to Co College my parents were like, you know what, we're just going to get you like the few stuff you need. You know, all you have to do is just go there, study. This is this is a new environment for me, you know. This and so is, the, the scholarship that you got helped you do what? How did it help you? Yeah. So the scholarship like really helped me like feel comfortable just transitioning from high school to college in a different state. The scholarship really helped me. Like it helped me look at my room. My room is at first. I didn't even have a comfortable bed. <laughs> Literally, my back hurt every single day. <laughs> and just knowing that I want that scholarship changed everything, you know? All right, you tell, tell us quickly. Victoria, I wish we could spend more time with you because you are the life of the party, the life of the room, but we have to move on. But I really want people to know how you're doing right now in school uh, in 30 seconds, okay? I, I, I am doing very well and I'm very, very grateful that y'all could like provide me with this scholarship because it's a life changer. It helped me. Look at me. I I have a good computer. You know, I have a good computer to do my homework. And it, it was it was really good. I am very grateful. Listen, we're gonna have to get yeah. you. We're gonna have a whole weekend, a whole webinar. Who is Victoria? I'm in Jumanji. Okay, you're gonna be our next featured host. We're the pleasure to see you. I know everybody enjoyed meeting you, and we wish you continued success. And stick, you're going to learn something, so stick around if you can. But we're going to move on to a program which is as relevant to you as everybody else in this room because you two are an alumni of Sullivan High School. So good luck to you. Um, you. Chad, you want to take it away? I think you were going to introduce Michael Zink at this time, right? All right, yes, I, it's up to me again. Um, <laughs> listen, I, I've been, um, I'm in the real estate world. My name is Michael Glasser. I'm president of the Friends of Sullivan We'll talk a little bit more about the Friends of Sullivan at the end of the meeting. But in my real estate practice, or my real estate practice, I've gotten to know a gentleman named Michael Zink. I knew him through Zoom calls for a whole year and a half during COVID. When we finally met and he invited me to a Cub game, he had no idea of my involvement with Sullivan High School. But he started telling me about his wife's uh, uh, grandfather, I think it is named Roger Sullivan. And he said, this guy's amazing. And I've learned all about this yep. guy. And um, Mike, there's a high school in the north side of Chicago named after him. I said, I know that. So from that odd coincidence, maybe this is meant to be, but we've been able to bring you all together, all 60 of you into this room tonight to hear Michael speak about somebody who means a lot to him, uh, which who is Roger C. Sullivan. So with that introduction in mind, it's my pleasure to introduce you to you, Michael Zink. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, it definitely is. I think it is serendipity. I was joking to Mike. I think my uh, late father-in-law and, and Roger kind of uh, nudged me along to this point because my, my father-in-law was Terry Corby, who was one of Roger's many great grandsons. And for years, uh, my father-in-law, he and I love American history and local history here in Chicago. We, and we had gathered all these information, all these artifacts over the years. And we would joke, we said we were probably two of about seven people on the face of the earth who know who Roger is, but we're, we keep gathering all these things. And so, uh, you know, it's he passed away, my father-in-law passed away in June of 2020. But all those years we were saying, you know, we'd like to, you know, get this word out there. And there's got to be people out there who want to hear about it. And then, as you heard earlier, Jan, I've known Jan for almost 20 years. Uh, again, just serendipity. Um, you know, I used to live at her house when I was in law school. I through some friends and connections, mm -hmm. taking care of her house while she was gone. So we've known each other. We've been very good friends for decades. And so when I told her about this, she was all excited too. So I think everything just came together uh, very well. So I'll be happy to show you uh, I've quite a few of these different things I'll show you uh, during the course of my talk here. And uh, you'll be hearing some, some uh, somewhat familiar names, names we, we've all heard in history books. 
and uh, never realized that uh, Roger had a uh, connection to all these. So um, I'm going to do it somewhat chronologically. So I'll, uh, I'll keep going and I'll share my screen as, um, as I go along. So um, first and foremost, um, uh, let me share my screen here. I'll show you a lot of this. The, all, all I'm talking about and much, much more is in um, a book I'm about to show you. Um, so there's a professor in Atlanta, Georgia. I think you can see my screen. Uh, professor Richard Allen Morton, um, he undertook uh, to write not one, but two volumes on Roger's life. The first one from 1881 to 1908. And uh, then the second one right here. And let me know if you can't see anything. But uh, Roger's, so this is volume two going all the way to his passing in 1920. Uh, professor Morton's at uh, Clark Atlanta University. And um, actually the second volume in particular is not only has a forward by Frank Sullivan, Frank Sullivan was the uh, first um, uh, department news affair, uh, Chicago Police Department news affair uh, reporter. He started the office there and then he was actually Richard J. Daly's press secretary. And so he, um, he uh, gave the forward in the book. And in fact, volume two actually won an award from the uh, Illinois State uh, Historical Society a few years ago for an award of superior achievement. So first, I just wanted to kind of talk about Roger's background. Uh, Roger's parents were not uh, born here in America. They were in Ireland. Uh, they were in the uh, Kenmere, Kerry, Ireland area. And I'll show you a little picture of Roger's father. This is Eugene Sullivan. It's a little small. Um, it's one of the only, in fact, I think it is the only known photo of Eugene. And uh, Eugene married Mary Sullivan. Excuse me, Michael. We're yes. not seeing those pictures. We're just seeing your list of what the pictures are. Oh, okay. Let me see what I can do about that. Hold on one second. Let me try a different screen share here. Let's see, we're on our, uh, our uh, IRA. All right, let me try it this way. <clears throat> Well, why, why you, uh, there we go. So that's uh, volume one of the book. And I'll, uh, and here's volume two. So let me uh, pull up, apparently I'm just gonna have to pull up each picture uh, one at a time here on the screen share, which is actually pretty easy. So this is a picture of Eugene Sullivan. <coughs> and his wife, Mary, let me show her quickly, give her her due. So they were married uh, in Ireland uh, and they uh, immigrated to America um, probably in the 1850s. Nobody knows for sure. They didn't show up in the census for the first time until 1860. And they settled out in Belvedere, Illinois, which is out in Boone County, pretty far west from here um, on the uh, northern tip of Illinois. And um, Roger himself uh, was born in 1861, uh, February 3rd to be exact. Uh, he moved to Chicago in uh, 1879. He got a job at the Chicago West Division Railway Company. And uh, I'll show you a picture of... Uh, very young Roger here at the age of, uh, at the age of 20. So this was in 1881. Um, so Roger moved here in Chicago in 1879 and, and 1880s were when he really uh, got involved in politics. Um, his parents passed, uh, his father passed in uh, 1886 at the young age of 49. Um, his mother passed at the age of 54 in 1893. Um, and his parents are still buried out in St. James Cemetery in Belvedere, and St. James was, was their church. Um, and actually, that's the church where Roger wound up uh, donating a lot of money uh, to continue their success out there. Uh, Roger's political involvement started locally here in Chicago, uh, which at the time, of course, only 20 plus years after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln was still largely Republican. Um, but his uh, involve involvements were on the Democratic side. He was probably at the 1888 Democratic National Convention supporting Grover Cleveland. He and another guy you'll hear about later, John Hopkins, who was later mayor of Chicago, uh, became good friends and they were both supporters of uh, uh, Grover Cleveland. Uh, in 1888, uh, in 1888 he was likely there, but in 1892 he was, Roger was a, a delegate from Illinois 
to the National Convention uh, in support of uh, Grover Cleveland. Cleveland lost in, eight, in 1888, but won in 1892. And uh, as you probably know, he's one of the, he's the only uh, president to have non-successive uh, terms twice. Um, in 1890, Roger wound up getting elected. This was the only elected office that Roger held, uh, the uh, clerk of the probate court of Cook County. I could not find any pictures of Roger in office at the clerk of the probate court, uh, but he lived, he was in that office from 1890 to 1894. And uh, it was also a nice uh, first introduction about Roger's uh, uh, approach toward racial equality. I, again, this is 1890, 1894. Uh, this is actually before Plessy versus Ferguson, which basically legalized segregation for the next 60 years until Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and so um, basically though, uh, Roger's approach was very different. So he had a personal secretary named William G. Anderson. I'll show you his picture in a moment. William G. Anderson was known, eventually known as Habeas Corpus Anderson. Um, and William Anderson, I'll show you his picture here and make it a little bigger. So uh, William Anderson uh, was uh, his personal secretary while clerk of the probate court. And Roger received a lot of flack for that. Um, you can imagine at the time, it was not common to have a, a, a black worker of any kind in that such a high post. Um, but Anderson went on uh, to graduate from law school um, became one of the first prominent black attorneys here in Chicago. Uh, as I said, his nickname was Habeas Corpus Anderson. He successfully filed many petitions for habeas corpus, which essentially requires the government to explain the crime for which a defendant is being held. Um, and uh, actually the Chicago History Museum in, uh, just a couple of years ago in, uh, I think it was a spring 2020 publication did a really nice write up of um, habeas corpus Anderson. But uh, Anderson wouldn't have had his start without Roger giving him that high profile position in the city government. Um, this was also a time uh, that a, a gentleman by the name of Julius Taylor, um, he was a, uh, also a black publisher, but he, was, um, uh, he published a publication called The Broad Axe here in Chicago. And um, basically he, was, he, he strongly advocated for equal rights of all men before the law. Um, constantly attacked Jim Crow, and he was a strong, strong supporter of Roger because he realized that Roger uh, was uh, largely an exception at the time. There were not many people giving uh, people of color those kind of breaks uh, right, you know, at a very young age. So Roger also, uh, at that point in the mid 1890s, again, he continued these during all these years to continue to build relationships, continue to really uh, up, get up in the hierarchy behind the scenes though. Um, he did run eventually for uh, the clerk of court of uh, Cook County. Let me get the exact title for it. The, uh, he ran as the Democratic Party uh, nominee for the county clerk of, Co of Cook County in 1894. This was also kind of the time when Roger started making his first enemies. Um, as, uh, as any pr uh, high profile uh, individual, they'll have many friends and love uh, some enemies along the way. Um, and one of the first actually was a guy by the name of Carter Harrison Jr. Carter Harrison Jr. was a, uh, a mayor of Chicago. He, his father, Carter Harrison Sr. also was a mayor of Chicago. And they were directly, they were cousins, uh, I think second times removed from the uh, presidents, uh, William Henry Harrison and Benjamin Harrison. That was also kind of interesting since uh, Roger was actually opposed to uh, Benjamin Harrison at the 18, 1892 convention. Um, but in any event, uh, Roger's involvement in 1894, running for the clerk of uh, court, um, began that kind of uh, animosity between he and, and Carter Harrison Jr., uh, who was uh, opposing him in the, in the election. And that's a, it was a theme that went on all the way up until almost the year that Roger died, uh, until they actually did have something of a, 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 res, uh, a, a reconciliation where they were walking arm in arm, uh, talking about a bill out in, out in Washington, D.C. And uh, one of the other controversial backgrounds of Roger was called the Ogden Gas. Uh, some people call it a scandal. Uh, others just called it the Ogden Gas deal. But I'll take you, I'll show you a picture of uh, that as well. Another great book that's out there about it. So this is the uh, book that came out just in the last few years about the Chicago shakedown, the Ogden Gas scandal. Well, it's a, it was a complicated kind of setup, but essentially what happened was uh, Roger uh, and then Mayor Hopkins uh, got together. They formed a corporation. In 1895, um, this franchise was granted by the city council. Nobody really thought anything of it. 
Um, then a few years later, the public monopoly here for gas, which was people's gas, wound up having to use a lot of the assets that um, the Ogden Gas Company that Rogers set up, um, they use their assets. And it wound up being mutually profitable. Both people's gas as well as Ogden gas wound up um, being profitable eventually. But what happened was Roger and about 11 others uh, all were pretty much the owners of this Ogden gas company. Um, and so about 13 years later, when it sold, um, after all these years of, of public use and, and, uh, and the people's gas uh, relationship, they wound up selling it for almost a million dollars each for each of their shares out of 13. And this is in 1913 dollars. So it was, it was quite lucrative. It was, some of the uh, publications improperly uh, thought it was tens of millions of dollars and it wasn't, but it was still quite a bit of money, tens of millions do of dollars in, this, uh, in today's money for sure. Um, but the Ogden gas scandal was pretty much one of the first major scandals in Chicago history uh, involving the government. Um, Hopkins actually wound up stepping down at the end of his tenure. Um, most of the people who were involved behind the scenes uh, as owners also either didn't run for their particular aldermanic offices again or um, simply lost uh, the next election. Um, so basically, uh, it was something that, you know, there's nothing illegal about it. There were never any charges about it. But it was one of those situations where, you know, there, there were people who raised eyebrows about it. And it certainly made a small number of people quite wealthy. But it was ultimately, at the end of the day, a business venture and a business gamble, really, for everybody who was involved. So um, one of the other business ventures that Roger was involved with, besides Ogden Gas, was called the Sawyer Biscuit Company. I'll pull you a picture of the Sawyer Biscuit Company. So this is, this is uh, one of the crates that uh, they used to carry them around. You still see them online every so often. People like to see the old pictures. But Sawyer, Bis Sawyer Biscuit became a major uh, national company uh, for biscuits and crackers and, and cookies. Um, and one of the things to know about uh, Sawyer Biscuit is that eventually um, it wound up getting sold and it became part of Keebler. Um, and actually one of the executives at Sawyer Biscuit uh, was named Salerno, who went out on his own and created his own company. So anytime you see Salerno or, or uh, Keebler at the store, you, you're seeing a direct line to uh, Roger Sullivan. And, uh, and Roger made a, a good fortune on the, in the cookie business. He started that in 1900 with his family, with his brother. One of the other uh, interesting voices and one of the names that's familiar probably to everybody here uh, was William Jennings Bryan, uh, the great commoner, ran for president I think, three times. Um, and uh, ran as a populist, uh, but he was another one that uh, Roger, uh, he saw Roger as a threat. Uh, he didn't like Roger for a number of reasons. Uh, for one thing, Roger was a Democrat and Democrats weren't exactly sold on, on uh, Brian, um, you know, especially as he kept losing presidential elections. 1896 was the only year that Brian even came reasonably close to winning and, and he still fell well short. Um, but he, Brian was particularly opposed to Roger because Roger was the chair of the uh, Gold Democrats. Uh, Roger was a believer in the gold standard, whereas, of course, William Jennings Bryan is known for his cross of gold speech. So they were at significant odds with each other on that point. Um, but then during uh, that run in 1894 for county clerk that I had mentioned, um, Bryan was uh, behind the scenes with that and trying to stop that. Well, again, dur during the 1896 convention, Roger returned the favor and, and uh, pulled some behind the scenes uh, uh, measures uh, during that convention. And so he, he and uh, William Jennings Bryan had a long uh, tenure pretty much for the rest of Roger's life uh, in opposition to each other at every possible turn. And we'll see later when Roger ran for uh, US Senate, it came into play yet again, uh, all those years later. And he ran in 1914 for the US Senate eventually. One of the gentlemen I mentioned earlier uh, was John Hopkins. And I'll show you a picture of Hopkins. Hopkins was, uh, as I said, a former mayor of, of Chicago, longtime friend of, of uh, Rogers, dating back probably to the 1880s or 1890s, um, probably got their starts together uh, politically uh, as well. Um, but John Hopkins, uh, they, he and Roger got to uh, con achieve control of the Illinois State Committee in 1902. 
Um, so for those of you, you know, for those who say Roger got his power starting this year, if there were any particular year, uh, that was probably about 1902. Uh, because at that point, that put Roger and Hopkins in charge of pretty much all state uh, patronage and, and the like. Uh, it, it really made them powerhouses behind the scene. Um, this again contributed to the long running rivalry with Carter Harrison Jr. Um, Carter Harrison uh, ran and won mayor of Chicago, but by 1905, Harrison had to basically, he was forced out of office. He had gotten into office um, on the public had really wanted at that point in 1901, they really wanted somebody who would allow for uh, public ownership of the public transportation, uh, which at that point had been privately owned. Um, and this was Harrison's ticket into office. Well, he didn't succeed with that. For one thing, just a few months into, uh, into his uh, um, uh, office, uh, he ran into a, a problem. Uh, and, and essentially what happened was uh, when, when he couldn't achieve anything uh, while he was in office with respect to that topic, he basically got voted out. A new guy named Edward Dunn came in. Well, Edward Dunn came in sort of on the same platform um, of trying to privatize, I'm sorry, trying to uh, make the public transportation public. Um, and it, it, one of the interesting things about Dunn at that point was he had a special attorney, special traction council, they called him, named Clarence Darrow. And basically what they were trying to do was a few months into the 1905 tenure of Edward Dunn, um, a strike happened with the Teamsters about public transportation. Well, um, Clarence Darrow and Mayor Dunn tried to get a, uh, something resolved and they just couldn't. In fact, Darrow wound up re uh, resigning a number of months later. Um, a new attorney came in to take uh, Darrow's place and actually got it done. Um, but at the end of the day, when it was all over with, uh, Mayor Dunn looked really weak, uh, really looked like a novice. And so Mayor Dunn's, um, Mayor Dunn's time was uh, pretty much up as well. Well, with two consecutive failed mayorships, or at least two consecutive mayors who really didn't seem that strong, that sort of helped Roger open the door to have all those disgruntled people who were following, all the voters, all the other uh, bureaucrats, all the other uh, people behind the scenes in the parties, they could see these last two mayors were pretty big failures. So they wound up going to Roger uh, and, the, and Roger was able to continue to organize them, strengthen the Democratic Party here in the city, uh, specific, especially in Chicago, but also countywide. Uh, Roger, this was obviously, this is the time where cars were few and far between. Um, and Roger was still able to really forge a lot of great relationships countywide, statewide, um, and as we'll see in a little while, even nationally. Um, 1912 really put Roger on the main map, and I'll show you uh, one of the images from the 1912 convention. So 1912 is when Roger really went, uh, went national. Uh, so this was a little flyer that uh, my father-in-law and I had in, in our uh, little collection of artifacts. So this is the Democratic National Convention in Baltimore, Maryland, 1912. Uh, in 1912, there ended up being four candidates for president. Uh, you had uh, the uh, incumbent who was William Howard Taft. Um, you had, eventually you had Woodrow Wilson. I'll go into, more into that in a moment. Um, you had Theodore Roosevelt eventually taking on a progressive party uh, and being their candidate. And then Eugene V. Debs took on uh, a role as the socialist candidate. Uh, and there's actually a great uh, book called Four Hats in the Ring by Lewis Gold that talks about the 1912 convention. Well, the 1912 convention, uh, it was getting, it was becoming clear to everybody that uh, whoever the democratic candidate would be would probably have a strong chance of winning the general election. The reason that was the case is because Taft as the incumbent um, had basically ridden Theodore Roosevelt's uh, coattails into office in 1908. Theodore Roosevelt went and did his own thing for a number of years. And then um, I don't know if he got, he seemed to have gotten another an itch to run again. Well, when Theodore Roosevelt approached Taft to sort of step aside and let him run again, of course, Taft told him absolutely not. And uh, Roosevelt was incensed and, and essentially started uh, his own party uh, campaign for the Progressive Party. Um, in fact, they, I, their convention that year was here in Chicago. But um, so that aut what automatically was going to split the party because Roosevelt was still very popular um, or at the very least he would uh, shave off a lot of votes that Taft would have gotten pretty easily as the incumbent. And so uh, it became clear that this democratic convention was going to be very important. 
Um, going into the national convention, uh, the guy who was uh, among everybody uh, believed to be the front runner was a guy named Champ Clark from Missouri. Uh, Champ Clark seemed to have all the votes. He seemed to have all the support. But as you know, you know, back then, conventions were not foregone conclusions as they are now. They were not coronations. They were actually uh, took a lot of uh, cajoling and, and negotiating, a lot of horse trading behind the scenes. And so uh, this, the uh, convention in 1912 also uh, saw uh, William Jennings Bryan again try to come back to the forefront. And why? Because Bryan could see that the winner of this convention in the Democratic Party was probably going to be president. And so what, um, what Bryan tried to do was deadlock the convention through various procedural maneuvers. Well, Roger got involved and Roger basically countered him and uh, checkmated William Jennings Bryan. And William Jennings Bryan basically was out of the picture. Um, so this this round went to Roger against uh, against uh, Brian, and so now that Brian was out of the picture, the question was: Was it going to be Champ Clark or any of these other candidates that were out there? Well, of course, Woodrow Wilson was one of the candidates, uh, not necessarily a fringe candidate. He was a professor, I believe, in Princeton out east, um, and started to get pretty well known among the party. Well, back then, of course, there was round after round of voting. Well. There were 43 rounds of votes uh, at this point during the convention that went all night, you know, these crazy demonstrations. And again, the book Four Hats in the Ring really goes into a lot of that. It's a lot of fun to read, especially if you're into politics. But uh, the bottom line is then um, Roger had already uh, sort, sort of, but not entirely, devoted the Illinois delegation to Champ Clark. Uh, in fact, Champ Clark had even won the Illinois vote. Um, however, after the 43rd vote, um, Roger uh, made, made a big change. N nobody knows exactly how or when they negotiated this, but at some point during the convention, during those first couple of days, uh, Roger had started talking with uh, Woodrow Wilson's uh, team. And essentially, uh, Roger uh, and another guy by the name of Tom Taggart in, in Indiana, who is sort of like the boss in, in uh, Indiana's delegation, um, decided to talk to uh, Wilson's crowd. And Wilson's crowd, nobody knows exactly sure what the deal was, but what, at the end of the day, uh, Roger agreed to release the Illinois delegates for Woodrow Wilson, despite the fact that he didn't win Illinois. Once Roger did that on the 40, 43rd vote in the 1912 convention, that opened the floodgates. Then all the other heads of every other major city, New York had Charles Murphy, uh, Indiana had Tom Taggart, they all followed suit. And as a result, uh, sorry, I have, a, I have a cat playing with stuff here. Hold on one second. Um, but as a result of Roger opening the floodgates, uh, all these other uh, leaders had their votes go right over to Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson won in very short order. Um, and uh, then the question became, well, what, what is Roger going to get out of this? Is he going to wind up getting federal patronage or some kind of a, a, a role in the administration? The answer was Roger really didn't get very much. Uh, you know, I think uh, after all the reading I've done about Roger and these various books, I think Roger really liked Woodrow Wilson uh, after talking to him quite a few times and seeing his platform. And of course, everybody knew uh, in 1912 that, uh, you know, the winner of that, that uh, convention was probably going to be president. So, um, but Roger didn't really get a whole lot from Woodrow Wilson for doing it, uh, for his trouble. And so um, Woodrow Wilson did, of course, wind up winning the nomination, did wind up uh, becoming a two-term president, um, and eventually winning the Nobel Peace Prize. At this point, Roger was uh, a national figure because of what he did in the 1912 convention. And so um, there were uh, some rumblings about Roger potentially running for vice president in 1916 uh, when, when Woodrow Wilson ran again. I'll show you a quick little uh, trinket of Roger as a vice presidential candidate. This is a uh, button, a political button of Roger for vice president in 1916. That was more of a local push more than anything else. It didn't really get much national traction and Marshall wind up, wound up staying as vice president in 1916. However, Roger did see that there were some opportunities. And so in 1914, Roger uh, ran for US Senate from Illinois. 1914 was a big year. I'll show you one of the uh, items about Roger's run for the U.S. Senate here. Oops. 
This is Roger during the primary in 1914. 1914 was a big year for U.S. Senate elections. Why? Because this was the first year that there was a direct election of U.S. senators. Before that, the U.S. senators were selected by the state delegations. Basically, the state representatives and state senators of every state would select the U.S. senators from each state. Um, then there was a, law, a scandal involving Senator Lorimer here in Illinois uh, about bribery among the state legislators uh, and other things that it became a national scandal. And so the, uh, I believe it was the 17th Amendment passed, uh, and this was the first election in 1914 where candidates were directly elected by the citizens of the state, by the voters of the state. And um, this, was also, uh, this, this was also a battle that um, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, that uh, William Jennings Bryan got involved again. So w Woodrow Wilson made William Jennings Bryan his Secretary of State. Probably good news for William Jennings Bryan, but bad news for Roger running in 1914 when he's probably asking for an endorsement from President Wilson, who was pretty popular. And as you would expect, there was no endorsement, almost certainly because of William Jennings Bryan's sway with Wilson as a Secretary of State. So Roger didn't get a whole lot of support nationally uh, for his run. A lot of what he had to do was statewide. And again, this is 1914. Cars aren't very, po aren't, uh, very populous. Uh, Roger's traveling all over the state, even, even making stump speeches, which were pretty uncommon back then. Again, largely because of uh, a lot of the things that were being put out there by William Jennings Bryan. And uh, yet another uh, guy who sort of showed animosity toward him, which I'll talk about shortly, William Randolph Hearst. William Randolph Hearst was a, a, a public mandate, uh, or a medium uh, mogul who really had it in for Roger uh, and, and really put some scandalous things out there against Roger. But Roger ran in 1914. He won the Democratic primary uh, for uh, U.S. Senate, and then he ran in the general election. He wound up losing the general election by about 13,000 votes. Um, and so um, he fell just a little short. But again, this was only 50 years after Lincoln's death, and so much of Illinois remained Republican. Um, and uh, so Roger had something of an uphill battle in that respect as well. Um, after the 1914 election, um, the, uh, Roger continued his activities here locally. Um, there was a story when uh, Tony Preckwinkle here locally became the uh, chair of the county party. Um, I'll show you that uh, it, interesting uh, misnomer by the Sun-Times. So when, when Tony Preckwinkle ran and uh, eventually became the uh, chair of the county uh, party about four years ago, the Sun-Times ran this picture of all the past chairs. And here up in the top left, very first picture is Roger. And the Sun-Times and so many others have said over the years he was the first chair of the county Democratic Party. He wasn't. He was never chair of the county Democratic Party. In fact, he wouldn't, wasn't really even interested in that back then. What he was, though, was he, Roger really got everybody together. He really organized people countywide, citywide. Um, and so there was an understanding really from 1902 forward that Roger was the head of the Democratic Party, whether it be the state, the county, the city, he was in charge. Um, and so I think that's probably where the misnomer, misnomer comes from. Um, as uh, Mr. Professor Morton says in one of his books, he, uh, Roger was sort of the iron fist in the Velvet Club. Uh, you know, he, he really did things behind the scenes. He was not a guy that was uh, front and center. Interesting story in 1915 was that um, Roger, so Roger uh, actually got back uh, at uh, Carter Harrison Jr. Uh, he supported uh, Harrison's opponent, Schweitzer, uh, for mayor, and uh, Schweitzer actually beat Harrison in the primary. Now, the interesting thing about this in 1915 is that 150,000 women registered to vote here in Illinois. And people say, well, how is that possible? Because, you know, that didn't, women's vote wasn't allowed until 1920. In Illinois, uh, we, in 1913, our state legislator passed a law allowing women to vote in local elections. Um, there was still a seriously unjust portion of it because women still could only vote as it tied to their husband's uh, citizenship by law and under the federal law. So there were still restrictions, but Illinois was seven years ahead of the curve in terms of suffrage. Roger was very much in favor of suffrage. Roger had four daughters and a son, 
And uh, his daughters and his wife were very uh, influential on his thoughts. Um, and Roger was very much in favor of suffrage years before it became the, uh, fabulous, the uh, famous thing to do. Um, another, in 1918, after, the, uh, after Roger's loss in the 1914 election and after his uh, futile attempt to become vice president in 1916, Roger then uh, became president of the Great Lakes, Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Company. Essentially, they, according to their website, they um, maintain the waterways, channels, create beaches, excavate harbors, things like that. And so he held that post for a couple of years. Then in uh, January 1920, Roger announced his retirement. Uh, he was only 59 years old or about to be 59 years old, um, but he really had achieved just about everything you could possibly achieve in uh, public service, it, albeit behind the scenes. And so uh, in January 1920, he announced his, reti his retirement, and then within a few months, he started to become ill. Uh, and in uh, April 14th of 1920, uh, he passed away of heart failure here in, uh, locally in the city of Chicago. Um, he, the outpouring of grief all over the country was enormous. Um, I, put, I pulled some of uh, the telegrams that came in. Um, he received, and, and uh, my father-in-law's family still has some, I think it's about 300 telegrams. Um, and so one of the first ones that came in was this one from President Wilson in the White House. Uh, you have my deepest and warmest sympathy. I shall never forget what a good friend your husband was to me. Um, so this is directly from the White House uh, the next day after Roger passed. Um, have, have a couple other interesting ones too. A guy named uh, John F. Fitzgerald sent one. And um, if the name sounds familiar, he is uh, John F. Kennedy's and Robert Kennedy and Ted Kennedy's grandfather. Uh, he was known as Honey Fitz. Um, he was the mayor of Boston. Uh, I think he was in Congress for a while out there. And so this came in from Boston. Another gentleman that was interesting that uh, Roger knew through, I think through all of his uh, utility work was a guy named Sam Insel. Sam Insel was the man who started uh, uh, Commonwealth Edison. Um, he was a personal assistant of uh, Thomas Edison himself in his younger years. Um, and then uh, Sam Insel actually wound up building the Civic Opera House. Sam Insel uh, was a very close friend of Rogers. Uh, Sam Insel even was a pallbearer at the funeral. Um, and in fact, uh, at St. Malachy Church over on the west side by the United Center, um, that's a church that Roger helped fund a great deal. There's actually a tower there, 120 foot tower that's dedicated to Roger. And inside the church, there's actually an organ dedicated to Sam Insel because Sam Insel uh, donated some money, I'm sure, at Ro Roger's behest uh, to St. Malachy Church. And St. Malachy Church uh, still stands to this day as well. Uh, one of the other interesting guys that I wanted to show uh, who's sent their condolences was a guy named Bernard Baruch. Uh, Bernard Baruch, uh, eventually, this was in 1920, but eventually Bernard Baruch became uh, quite a power broker. Um, he became a, a, a direct uh, confidant of Woodrow Wilson. Um, he advised him during the Paris Peace Conference. Um, he actually became a very close advisor of Franklin Roosevelt in, uh, during World War II. Um, and, and Baruch actually represented America. He was America's representative at the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission after World War II in terms of determining how the world was gonna use nuclear weapons. So uh, Bernard Baruch in his uh, younger years was also a friend of Rogers. And uh, one of the things I wanted to show too, hopefully I can get this on the screen. Um, there's actually a two, two minute footage of Roger's actual funeral um, that my, my father-in-law was able to get some years ago from what was then known as the Histor Chicago Historical Society. Let me see if I can share that for you.
So when Roger died, there were approximately 200,000 people that lined the streets from Chicago out the hillside. Um, it was uh, it was known back. It was approximately the second largest funeral ever attended in the history of Chicago. Um, the second half of the business day, the next business day, I believe, was uh, closed down to the city. Um, people born from uh, city all the way out west uh, in the suburbs. And so there were a couple other interesting stories about Roger's background that uh, even I didn't know about until recent years. Um, one of them involved uh, the Chicago Cubs here at Wrigley Field. Um, as you probably know, uh, Weedman was the original owner of Wrigley Field and the Cubs before it eventually became Wrigley Field. Well, Weedman was getting into some financial troubles in about 1916. He also at that point had a chance to buy the Chicago Cubs, Weedman did in 1916. Well, he needed to come up with $500,000 in 1916 uh, money very quickly. One of the people he turned to uh, was Roger Sullivan and his son Bocious. Um, they thought about donating or giving $75,000 to become part owners. At the end of the day, they did not. But I always uh, used to joke with my father-in-law that we, you know, we could be calling it Sullivan Field uh, to this day instead of Wrigley if they had given, up, given that money over to Weedman. Um, for those of you who may have any uh, involvement down in uh, Champaign-Urbana, the radio station WILL down there was actually uh, donate, uh, uh, donated uh, in 1926. It was uh, opened as WILL, and it was known as the Roger C. Sullivan Memorial Station. Uh, after Roger's death in 1926, his son donated a, a substantial amount of money to build the building in which the radio station was uh, held. And so for about 16 years, it was known as the Roger Sullivan Station. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, St. Malachy Church on the west side by the United Center has a 120-foot bell tower donated uh, uh, in Roger's name. And then, of course, uh, we have Sullivan High School to this day. And um, with respect to uh, Sullivan High School, it was then known as Roger Sullivan Junior High School. Um, it was dedicated in uh, 19, uh, November 16, 1928. And Sam Insel, who I'd mentioned earlier, actually came and delivered the keynote uh, at the dedication in, in memory of Roger. And so Roger's, uh, Roger's effects uh, over the years, as you can tell, they may have been uh, slightly watered down, but they were pretty important. Um, and uh, he had an indelible mark here in the city of Chicago for many, many years. Uh, and the name Roger Sullivan uh, hopefully will continue to ring true and loud for many years to come. Did anybody have any questions? Uh, anything? Thank you so much, Michael. I think we're going to open up to Q and A right now, right? We're going to get tested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you open up your if you open up your emails, I've sent all of you a quiz. <laughs> Do we know how it was decided that the high school would be named after Roger? No, I couldn't find that. Um, I know that you know in those years after he passed. Um, there were high schools being built um, on a regular basis. And, and Roger's name was, like I said, he was very, very popular among his peers. Um, you know, even his enemies after he passed away um, largely sent their condolences. Carter Harrison himself sent a condolence despite all their years of enmity, enmity between each other. So um, I would imagine it would have to have been uh, Roger's many relationships here locally that when a high school was needed up in Rogers Park. Um, Rogers' name was one of the first to come up, I'm sure. Well, Michael, thank you so much. Um, uh, probably an historical event here uh, to, for us to commemorate the uh, person who, for whom the school is named after. Uh, Chad, do you have any uh, final comments? Well, I just want to, I wanted to say thanks for everyone for joining us. We're looking to continue doing uh, more stuff like this in the future. And I know I see a lot of traffic in the chat there that you all seem to be wanting to connect with each other quite a bit. Uh, we, we have had a, um, uh, recently a $25 million renovation at the school, uh, which has uh, been awesome. The, the, the district has reinvested in the school and it, look, it looks more beautiful than ever. We've really tried to maintain the natural architecture of the school, but really renovated and innovated classroom spaces. Got four new uh, science labs in the school. We have a full fitness center, weight room. I recently redid the uh, the main gym in the school. We're hopefully gonna cut the ribbon on that real soon as well. Put a new floor in there that has a Chicago skyline on it. And we uh, named the gym after Jan Joukowsky actually. It's the Jan Joukowsky Gymnasium. So we're excited to, to uh, ribbon cut that. 
Um, we also have a full, uh, thanks to the Roger Park Builders Group, ha we have a, a full kitchen classroom. So students uh, with special needs are learning life skills like cooking and uh, cleaning and things like that. So they can work in uh, restaurants and hotels. Uh, so we've done a lot of great renovations in the school and the district has uh, kicked in with $25 million to give us a new roof. Uh, we have all new white floors. All the floors are white. If you can remember being in Sullivan when you were younger, probably the hallways were quite dim and dark. Uh, they are very bright and vibrant today. We have all new windows and all the spaces too. And uh, I know there's a, a few events coming uh, up that some, uh, I think the class of 72 is coming uh, to see the school and the renovations. Unfortunately, the pool um, was, uh, was functioning as about four years ago. We were uh, teaching kids how to swim and doing lifeguarding classes there and also had the park district there. But uh, about four Octobers ago, uh, four years ago, we, we found a hole about the size of a nickel uh, in the bottom of the pool. And that, that hole uh, ended up being a $5.4 million hole. So right now the pool is uh, not functioning. Um, it's vacant um, and uh, we're hoping to raise some funds eventually to get the pool restored and, uh, and, and back online eventually. Uh, Chad, I have a question. I'm Byron Block uh, in Potomac, Maryland, and um, I heard earlier that there's a, a Sullivanite who is nearby in Silver Spring. Maybe he and I will get together. Um, I hope so. But um, my question is, if you're familiar, as I think most of us are, with the Sullivan Alumni Association, that for well over 20 years not only provided scholarship uh, you know, funding to help the new graduates and all, uh, to move on to college, but also published four times a year uh, a wonderfully informative newsletter. Um, and now, after about a year and a half of its demise, is there any opportunity or chance to somehow resurrect uh, the Sullivan Alumni Association? And along those lines, one other subcategory, the prominent alumni wall, which was supported by the Alumni Association, since the Alumni Association no longer exists, what will happen to the wall? Will it be up permanently? Yeah, well, uh, I'll answer both your questions. Uh, uh, the first question is the prominent alumni wall is still up. It's uh, in the main atrium area to the left as you go in that middle hallway. So it is still is firmly there. On the right-hand side, we've actually put, we put the graduates, the senior class each year. So you can kind of see the prominent alumni and the senior graduates in their cap and gown. So that's great. And then, you know, I know that uh, Dick Hurwitz uh, was uh, highly involved at the school when I first started there. And, you know, after the Alumni Association uh, sort of closed, the Friends of Sullivan, uh, thanks to Mike Glasser and, and hit the board, really has picked up kind of where they left off. And we've actually been reading, you know, uh, meeting recently and trying to think of uh, uh, Friends of Sullivan Alumni Committee, sort of a subcommittee to con continue some of that work. And I think we're starting to get some interest and in, Sounds like you are, you know, wanting some of those old sort of things to kind of come back, the centennial and, and getting this communication back at, together. So we, we're trying to figure out what that looks like for our Friends of Sullivan alumni subcommittee. Mike, did you want to mention anything there? You know, there's some tremendous energy and interest um, for us to maintain an alumni presence. Um, I'm, I'm a resident of Rogers Park. I'm not, I'm an Oak Park River Forest graduate, but in, light, in lieu of, uh, because of Chad's uh, energy and tremendous accomplishments, he's pulled me in. And uh, in fact, I'm not wearing a Sullivan hat. Um, but, you know, the Friends of Sullivan was created to offer support to Chad and to the school. We've done a number of things over the last six years. Um, everything from doing an annual Thanksgiving celebration for the refugee students. It's an amazing experience to see the refugees share with us those things for which they are thankful for in our new country. Uh, Chad, we have how many new Afghan refugee students now? Yeah, we, we've enrolled 40 Afghan families in the last two months. We'll, we'll soon probably do that with the Ukrainian families in a, probably in the next six to eight months as well. It's uh, And there was a book, uh, do you want to mention the book also, Chad? Yeah, uh, you might have heard that there was a book uh, released uh, this fall uh, called Refugee High. Uh, it actually came from an article from a, the Chicago Magazine, which is owned by the Tribune Company. Uh, an, an author, um, you know, found out kind of what we were doing at Sullivan and saw the turnaround at Sullivan. Because honestly, you know, Sullivan, uh, about 10 years ago, Chicago Public Schools 
uh, closed 50 schools. If you were around this area, you probably heard. But the last minute, they decided not to close high schools, and Sullivan was on the list to get closed because of the poor performance of the school. We're on academic probation for 13 years, declining enrollment. Uh, there were in 2012, there were 700 suspensions and 75 arrests. So it was it wasn't the best place for children. Uh, at the last minute, Chicago schools decided not to close high schools because they couldn't figure out the gang lines. Uh, so Sullivan was uh, sort of stayed, and, and I got a chance to take over and lead the school. And Chicago Magazine read an article about the work that we had done at Sullivan, turned around in 2016. That author uh, got a book deal, and then she followed us around in the 2016-2017 uh, school year. From the day one to the end of the day, she was there almost every day. And if you get a chance, it's called Refugee High. Um, and it's, it's a great book that just sort of chronicles the, the, the life of Sullivan High School and the current times we're in. Uh, and all the different students and their stories and, and a little bit of my personal life and one of the teachers personal lives too. It's got a lot of great pra praise. The Washington Post did a, a great article about it as well. Uh, so um, we're, we're very excited about that as well. So, um, you know, we have your email addresses and we, we would love to stay in touch with you all. If any of you want to step forward and, you know, I don't think we're going to be in a position to publish a, 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 a hard copy of of a sentinel, but we certainly have this wonderful medium called the internet. We could use, and, and we just need some, we need you guys to step forward if you want to um, help uh, keep news about alumni um, out there and circulated. We, we've yeah. successfully gotten some names tonight. We're also, um, um, we're also, we're also in the process of uh, creating a 3D Zoom tour. Uh, that I hope will be completed this spring uh, that we'll be able to launch out where you can literally from the, wherever you're sitting, I guess some of you are in Maryland, some of you are in North Dakota, wherever you may be sitting, you'll be able to actually take a 3D Zoom tour of the school and kind of walk around the school uh, via via your computer, which I think will be really cool. So I have uh, two requests. Um, we apparently uh, had a number of yearbooks that were being, when we did a renovation of the library, a few years ago, uh, books were being the yearbooks were being stored in the basement, elevated uh, by at least three feet off the ground in case there was a flood. Unfortunately, nobody anticipated a broken pipe above the books. So our uh, collection of, of Sullivan Navalises, as they call, uh, are gone. And we'd love to uh, reach out to all of you uh, who might have an extra yearbook to donate back to the school. So that's one um, request that's out there. And the other um, request or a, a kernel of thought for you to digest is um, financial support. And I'm not gonna lay it down heavy. This is not a fundraising event tonight, but I would love for you all to consider the students you met earlier tonight. Um, we received a very generous gift last year from one of your colleagues. And we have a, a wonderful committee, the Sullivan Committee, with uh, Rick uh, from the class of 62. Rick, is that right, Rick Whelan? Yes. And, and Ed, um, also from your class. We, and the, uh, it seems like at, at, and 62, 72, we, we, the, the twos are good years. But um, we, we have a real momentum with the alumni group. And we would love to see the alumni of the school continue to offer support to graduating seniors on the one hand, alternatively or in addition to help support the types of things that the Friends of Sullivan is doing, um, oftentimes in consultation with the principal to bring the soul, bring the energy, support for the arts, support for athletics. Uh, we need some funds to create a counseling suite. Uh, much of that money is raised, we need that extra money. So. I, I can I promise you that any funds that would ever be donated to the Friends of Sullivan will see a, a high 90% of that amount is going to go directly to supporting the school mm -hmm. and the children. So if we have your emails. We promise we won't bombard you. But from time to time, if you see an email from us or if you'd like to get involved, if you have ideas, if you just want a reunion that you want some help on, we're an open book. We, we'd love to dialogue with you. I'd like to uh, welcome in, um, Dr. Merrill Cook, who's on the Friends of Sullivan board, who's here tonight, uh, Chuck Rosenberg from the class of 72, 
who's here tonight. I don't believe Dorothy Gregory, the other board member, um, who have been really working hard serving this board for the last few years. And of course, our new alumni committee with Rick and Ed. And then, of course, Coach Mike Poles has some ideas for what we can be doing in the fall in terms of reunion. So uh, with the improvements done at the school, with this incredible group of immigrants and refugees that make up roughly 50% of the students, um, any of you are interested, we'll send you the video of the Thanksgiving celebrations. These are remarkable young people like Victoria, remarkable with wonderful futures. And it, it's exciting because I know that Sullivan supported refugees only you know, a generation ago. I have a recording up there too for anybody who wants to review this, this, uh, this wonderful meeting today. So one of the reasons that we, we've, we've wanted to form the Friends of Sullivan too is um, I'm restricted by, as you know, federal and state funds and how they flow into the school and there's lots of red tape around them. And so the Friends of Sullivan really can, can use funds a little bit differently than I can use and there's less federal and state guidelines to use those funds. So their funding really helps us support things that we typically can't support at the school. Uh, even like even like even the simple thing of like a thousand dollar scholarship, I can't give out thousand dollar scholarships mm -hmm. to kids with school funds. But the Friends of Sullivan, since they're a non for profit, can you know things like that. Um, even even capital improvements from time to time are things that are, I typically don't have the funds to do or pull off. So again, those funds uh, are even at one point CPS told principals they couldn't buy food for events. So we had we were using Friends of Sullivan funds to buy food for events. So. I appreciate that. We will definitely uh, we'll be in touch. And the graduation ceremony last year, Chad, what about that? Yeah, yeah I mean, even we, we had to move, because of COVID, we had to move our graduation from Loyola's Mundelein Hall to outside. We ended up doing it at a Lane, Lane Stadium field. We couldn't find a vendor that had a stage and had all the equipment that we needed to, to, um, to have the graduation on the field for the parents and the kids. So the Friends of Sullivan sponsored that whole, that whole event and we're at allowed us to allowed us to um have that graduation otherwise we wouldn't have been able to have the graduation because i'd uh, be remiss also if i didn't acknowledge somebody else very important and that's my good friend walt kennedy who's uh, uh taken on the task of uh putting this event together all the back uh behind the scenes stuff electronically with the postcard and the printing and the postage and the um, setting up the, the whole gizmo, everything that happened, the registration, a tremendous amount of effort and time. Walt, can you just say hello and acknowledge you? Acknowledge you. Sure. Uh, Hi, and thanks. It's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to help any way I can. Um, well, Walt's just a uh, Rogers Park resident who loves the community. He personally has been involved in the transition of the library into a global center. Walt spent uh, days working on the bookshelves and and uh, just doing that quiet stuff that makes a project successful and your dedication to the school is just so much appreciated and thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody stay in touch with Thanks, us. Sir. Let's keep the party going.